So chapter 11 begins a new section in John's gospel. <clears throat> Until now Jesus has been preaching and teaching to the people and he has been having an ongoing debate with the uh, Jewish leaders. And he has, by his declarations and miracles, put forth the idea that he's the divine Son of God. All of this taking place, as I said, through dialogue. John is showing Jesus talking to one group after another. And John has also demonstrated that as a result of all these activities, a growing number have come to believe in Jesus, and a far greater number have uh, disbelieved. Imagine, with, with all the miracles and all the things that he's done, there were more who disbelieved than, than those who believed. If you're ever wondering sometimes, I sure wish we could do miracles today. I'm sure a lot more people would believe. Well, you know, the Lord Himself was there and they, they didn't believe and He was doing miracle. So this cycle, as we said, uh, has repeated itself enough times to become the major pattern in John's gospel. Now in chapter 11, the time for Jesus' passion, and uh, passion, you, you read that in commentaries and books and so on and so forth, and the term passion is just a short form way of referring to the final days of suffering and resurrection. So instead of saying Jesus is suffering and His trial and His death and His torture and death and then His burial and then His glory, you know, instead of saying that whole long sentence, uh, all of that information is compressed down to a single word, the word passion. So when we say Jesus' passion, we're talking about the entire experience. So the passion is drawing near. So John's book begins to compress time. Very interesting how this uh, works. In the first 10 chapters, John describes events that took place over a 30 to 33 month period. 10 chapters for almost three years. The last 11 chapters of his book will describe the words and events that took place in the last two or three months of Jesus' ministry here on earth. So a compression is beginning to take place of what's going to happen. So the very first and very spectacular event that John describes in detail is the death and the resurrection of Lazarus. And Lazarus, of course, was a friend of his, of Jesus. Imagine, Jesus had a, a friend. He had apostles, followers, disciples, and then he had a buddy. <laughs> he had a friend. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear what they talked about. You know. They called him a friend. But anyway, he's a friend of Jesus. And uh, Lazarus was also the brother of Mary and Martha, and they lived in Bethany, and Bethany was just a few miles out of, uh, uh, away from Jerusalem. Now, except for his crucifixion, this will be the last public action that Jesus will do. From now on, he will be uh, exclusively in the company of his disciples. So from chapter 11 forward, he's just talking to his disciples. No more talking to the crowds, no more teaching of the people. So with this particular miracle, the resurrection of Lazarus, Lazarus uh, Jesus is going to end his public mis ministry. Imagine, he, talk about ending on a high note. This is a pretty high note right there. He'll also prove beyond a doubt his divine power. All the miracles that he did were enough to prove that, but this one here is, there's no doubt anymore. And of course, it'll provide a preview of his own death and resurrection, which is to come in the near, in the near future. You know, the apostles will not be able to say, wow, Jesus resurrected from the dead, something we've never seen before. Can we really believe that He did that? No, Jesus provides a preview of what's to come. He demonstrates that He has the power to raise someone else from the dead. So if you've got the power to raise somebody else from the dead, surely that power is in you for your own resurrection. So let's go, that's the kind of preamble, let's go to Chapter 11 and begin, uh, begin reading uh, verses one to six. It says, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, 
this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. So we have to understand that everything Jesus said and did had its purpose and had as its purpose the creation of faith in the hearts of the people. That's what he was there to do, to create faith in them. Uh, soon he himself would be killed. He knew this and his disciples had to be prepared to face his death without losing their faith. Because if they lost their faith, then the mission you know, would have to be scrubbed. There'd be nobody to carry on the work. So he himself wasn't worried about death. He already said that the Father gave him the authority to both lay down his life and then pick it up again in John chapter 10, verse 18. He's already said, you know, I can do this. His disciples, however, needed some help in experiencing the death of their leader without being totally crushed. And so the, the, the raising of Lazarus, not just to show that Jesus you know, had the power to do that, another purpose for it was to prepare the apostles for his own death without totally losing you know, their faith. So the miracle um, was not only to create faith in new disciples, it was also to strengthen the faith of existing disciples in the face of death. As a matter of fact, this section has more to do with how the disciples react to Lazarus' death than Lazarus himself. Notice Lazarus doesn't say a word. There's nothing from Lazarus. I would love to hear what Lazarus said, but John doesn't record anything that Lazarus says because it really isn't about him. It's about the people who witness it and how they reacted. So interestingly enough, John divides the story into four parts, showing how four different people reacted to Lazarus' death. Very interesting how he does this. So the first group of people to react are the apostles themselves. themselves. So let's read there. It says, um, then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you and you were going there again? So the apostles noticed not so much the death of Lazarus, but the threat of death to Jesus and consequently to themselves. You know, if they go back to the area where there's trouble, you know, there's trouble where they just left. Where they just left, you know, they were about to kill Jesus. You know, he, he kind of escaped, if you want. And now he wants to, to go back to the same area in a very public way. And so the apostles react with fear. That's their reaction. Let's keep reading. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And so Jesus reassures them by explaining that their safety is not measured by the power of their enemy, but rather by whose side they're on. Don't worry about how strong the enemy is, he says. Consider whose side you're on. Are you on the side of light or are you on the side of dark? Which side are you on? You know, uh, Jesus says, He's the light. He guarantees the way. He guarantees safety. He creates day wherever He is. So to be with Him is to be safe, not to stumble, no matter how difficult the road. In other words, if you're with Jesus, you're safe no matter what the situation is. And then he says, the enemies of Jesus, they're the night, they're the darkness. Their plan will fail. In this case, the Jews who want to kill Jesus before it's time. And their plan will fail because they're on the wrong side. That's why their plan will fail. Not because they are weak, not because they don't have a plan. And so in essence, Jesus is saying to His disciples, because they're afraid, if you're not with Jesus, you can never win no matter how strong you are. But if you are with him, it doesn't matter what the enemy has. They won't win in the end. And so we keep reading his, you know, his conversation with them. Verse 11, this he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. 
<laughs> they weren't quite convinced. <laughs> so Jesus has said, you know, let us go in the beginning. At you know, the previous verses, let's go to Lazarus, he said, all of us together. And seeing their fear, he then says, okay, I will go. If you don't want to go, I'm going to go. And so the apostles now think he's just asleep and trying to discourage Jesus, they say, well, if he's just sleeping, he'll be okay by himself. You don't have to go. And by extension, if he doesn't have to go, who else doesn't have to go? Mm -hmm. They don't have to go. They're still pushing to not go. <laughs> and if Lazarus isn't sick, if he's just asleep, so much the better. Then you know, we don't, there's no reason for us to go. You know, it's always easier to discourage someone who wants to go forward than swallowing our fear or pride and going with him. You know, we often kill good initiatives, not because they won't work, but because many times we're afraid. If that person goes forward, then we're going to have to go forward. And so we keep reading, verse 13. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And, uh, uh, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So he explains plainly that Lazarus is dead. He also expresses his joy at the fact that God uh, has worked out the circumstances in such a way that Jesus will perform a great miracle before their eyes and encourage them to believe. The thing that is uh, driving their fear is the weakness of their faith. That's what's driving their fear. And so in order to kind of uh, bolster their courage, Jesus understands that what he needs to do is bolster their faith. The stronger your faith, the stronger your courage. The weaker your faith, the weaker your uh, courage. I, I always say, you know, there is no faith without risk. When something's a sure thing, there's no faith required there. You know, faith always has an element of risk in it. Okay? Otherwise, it's not faith. So once more, he encourages them to faith and courage by saying, OK, let us all go. Let's go to him. Let's all go together. Verse 16, therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. So Thomas, after Jesus invites them all once more to come, finds his courage. Funny, he's the guy that finds the courage, right? He's the doubting Thomas, we always call him. But we need to remember, long before he was the doubting Thomas, he was the Thomas that said, hey, let's go, let's go. If we die, we die. Let's do it. Let's go for it. And so in this exchange, the apostles went from fear to courage. But Jesus' miracle would eventually bring them to the ultimate goal, and that is to uh, the goal of faith, complete faith in Jesus. OK, so one group, how they reacted, the apostles reacted with fear. Another individual is Martha. Martha, in verse 17, let's read, it says, So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb uh, for days. So the body is in the tomb for four days. Now you need to understand the Jews did not embalm dead bodies. The Egyptians did that, but they, the Jews didn't do that. They merely perfumed, they cleaned the body, they perfumed it, they wrapped it in cloth and they put it into the tomb. So four days already, dead in a hot stone tomb, no air, the body will begin, to, um, will begin to decompose. So we continue reading, verse 18. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So Martha respects Jesus. She sees him as a great prophet and healer, and she knows that he could have healed him. She even expresses this idea. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. So Jesus is telling her plainly what he's about to do. He's about to you know, raise Lazarus from the dead. Verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. How interesting. He says to her, well, he's going to rise. I'm, going to, I'm going to raise him up. And she says, yeah, I know he's going to rise up. And then she quotes doctrine to him. Resurrection on the last day. She doesn't hear what he says. She just hears what she thinks he said. 
So she repeats what she has learned as a good Jewish woman, that at the end of the world, the good and the faithful Jews will all be raised from the dead. Um, uh, so she's reasonable. She's controlled. She doesn't want to bother God. Her response to death is resignation. Well, it is what it is. He's dead. You, you could have done something had you been here on time. I know you're a healer. You could have healed him. And Jesus says to her, you know, I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise him from the dead. Yes, that's right. Of course you're going to raise him from the dead at the end of the world. He didn't say at the end of the world. She's thinking, yeah, at the end of the world that'll happen. And you know what? I accept that and it's, it's OK. You know, she's such a reasonable Martha. You know, I love Martha. If it wasn't for Martha's, nothing get done in the church. You know that, eh? If it wasn't for the Martha's, you know, we wouldn't get anything done in the church. So Martha is one of those, one of those people. So she is resigned to the fact that death is true and death is there and somewhere in the future, according to the religion she has learned, there will be a resurrection. But for her, um, uh, death is real and resurrection is a doctrine, a true doctrine that she believes, but something less real than the death that she faces. So Martha reacts with a resignation. So verse 25, we keep reading, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Oh. I'm sorry. Jesus says to a person, do you believe this? You know how fantastic that is? God is just saying to this poor woman, do you believe me? Imagine, do you believe me, he says. So Jesus reveals to her the reality behind the doctrine. If there is a resurrection from the dead, the one who produces that resurrection is standing right in front of her. <laughs> and he's real. He's not just a doctrine or a teaching. He's real. If by faith you are united to the one who produces the resurrection, the resurrection will become a greater reality in your life than death. She is resigned to death. And what he's trying to do is get her to focus on resurrection on life. So Jesus says that the main, excuse me, that the union with Him through faith gives believers two things. First of all, that person will have life, true life, the kind of life that is not enslaved to the fear of death, the kind of life that has hope even in the face of death. It's not easy to have, believe in resurrection. I mean, look around you. There's death everywhere, uh, everywhere. Turn on, turn, on the, turn on the TV, right? Uh, entertainment programs are about death. All the lawyer shows are about death. All the cop shows are about death. It's always about death. Try to find a TV show where somebody doesn't die. And then you turn on the news. Well, oh, that's about death. Numbers. 100,000 were killed in, uh, in Syria. Now another 1,500 with, uh, with the poison gas. What's the difference? They're all dead anyways, death. And then there was a fire. And what do you want to know? Well, how many died? And then this child was kidnapped and, and was killed and so on and so on. It's all about death. So you know, this is a hard sell in, the, in, in our world. We believe in life. We believe in resurrection. But the evidence around us is overwhelmingly about death. And that's, that's Martha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, I know, one day we're going to resurrect. And Jesus is saying, look at me, pay attention. I'm the one who's going to give you the life that you want. I'm the one who's the power behind that doctrine. So the person united to Jesus will never die, he says, will never be extinguished, will never be separated from God. Death will only be momentary. I think that's why God um, created sleep. There was no sleep before sin. You know? Excuse me, the sleep came when Eve was created. Excuse me. I mean, there was no sleep you know, when Adam was there. 
But I think sleep is a precursor to resurrection. We understand how resurrection is going to be, why? Well, because we go to sleep at night and then we wake up again. And that's what death is like. We go to sleep, we die, and then we wake up again. We've got thousands and thousands and thousands of examples throughout our life of this happening. So Jesus you know, challenges Martha's inadequate view of resurrection that produces this resignation in her. She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even He who comes into the world. So Martha goes from intelligent faith, you know, intellectual faith, resignation up here in the brain, to living faith down there in the heart. Note that she doesn't talk about the resurrection, but rather it's her view of Jesus that changes. Note her response. She says, yes, not maybe, not later, yes. Lord, she acknowledges His sovereignty. I believe. Believing is accepting as true what Jesus says about who He is. Some people say, well, uh, how, do I, how do I end up believing in the resurrection? You know, what, what does that feel like? Well, it doesn't feel like anything. The definition of believing is, I accept as true what God says. Despite the evidence around me and despite how I feel, I accept as true. This is a true statement. So when Jesus is saying, do you believe me? He's saying to Martha, do you accept as true what I'm telling you, even though you haven't seen it yet? And she says, yes. You see what I'm saying? She said, yes, I believe. She accepts as true. And then she, she calls him Christ, the anointed one of God. That's his title. And she says, you're the son of God. She accepts his divinity. Who comes into the world, the Messiah, the Savior, my Savior. So, for Martha, Lazarus' death was the greatest of realities. Resurrection was far away as a doctrine of her religion, bringing little comfort for the moment. So Jesus redirects her attention so that it focuses not on the death before her or the resurrection in the future, but rather on Himself. Don't, don't try to see to the future to the resurrection. Don't look at death, which is right now. He says, look at me. Stay focused on me, the only one who could give her life now in spite of the daily terror of death and also give her absolute assurance now of everlasting life, not just a vague promise into the future. So Martha is resigned to the, or begins as being resigned to the death that has taken place. You know, she's a good soldier. She's a good little soldier. And Jesus is saying, you know, stop being resigned to death. We, I've overcome it. I've overcome it. Stay focused on me. Don't focus on death. Don't focus on the future. Focus on me. So she goes from resignation okay, to faith. Faith in Christ. All right. The third reaction or person that John looks at is Mary. Let's take a look at this. It says, so when she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, the teacher is here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha um, met him. Then the Jews who were with her at the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. So Martha goes and gets Mary and sends her to Jesus and the others follow. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping. Let's stop there for a second. So Mary's reaction to Jesus is similar to Martha, but her reaction to Lazarus' death is sorrow. Sorrow. She's not reasonable. She's not like Martha. She's not a reasonable you know, Martha type. She just lets it go. The floodgates open. She's crushed. She's crushed. She says the same thing that Martha says. If you would have been here, you could have prevented this. 
but she doesn't accept. You know, you, haven't you ever gone to a funeral or your parents or someone in the family and watch how different people react to the death of the same individual? You know, some are resigned to it, well, you know, he had a good life, and da, 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 da. Others are weeping, they're, you can't, you know, they're just weeping, they, 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 they can't reason it out. Such was the difference between these, these two women. Let's keep reading. Uh, Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then it says, Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him referring to Jesus, of course. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man also from dying? So that's the groups of people now that said, you could have saved them. So notice Jesus' initial reaction to Mary was his own human emotion. You know, he was moved, it says. Um, the Greek word means a kind of a trembling caused by emotion. You know when you're just on the edge of crying, your bottom lip starts to shake and you, <laughs> You're trying to hold it back. You know, that's what this word moved me. And he was troubled, he was disturbed, he was uncomfortable emotionally. And then it says he wept. Uh, it wasn't the first time that Jesus, we always say that's the shortest verse, you know, Jesus wept. It's not the first time Jesus wept. He wept for Jerusalem because it uh, rejected him in Luke chapter 13. And it wouldn't be the last time. He wept in the garden before his death while he prayed. Hebrews chapter five talks about that. So I think Jesus reacted in this way because this is a legitimate reaction that a human person should have when facing death. This business of, no, no, don't cry, you know, come on, you know, that's enough. No, no, that, somebody dies, it hurts. When it hurts, we cry. We've been designed to release emotion in a variety of ways, including uh, weeping. So Jesus weeps, that is the normal reaction for uh, uh, the death of an individual that we love. Also, uh, he felt emotional and spiritual discomfort at facing the horrible results of sin and Satan in uh, Lazarus' death. And then the physical expression of sorrow. In other words, here is a demonstration of Jesus' humanity. It was pretty human, wasn't it? He felt bad, he was moved inside, he's trembling. He cries, it said it, he was his friend. There were people dying every day in Jerusalem. Jesus wasn't crying for them. But when your friend dies, think of your friend, whoever you know, is your friend, and you find out that your friend just died, uh, you probably have the same emotion. So I said that this was a, a legitimate human reaction shared by both Mary and Jesus, but let's remember, Jesus was also God. And so in the next few verses, Jesus demonstrates how God reacts to death. We've seen the apostles, we've seen Martha, you know, the apostles with fear, Mary, uh, Martha with resignation, uh, Mary with sorrow, even Jesus with sorrow. Now looks, that, let's look at Jesus' reaction, not as a human, but as the Son of God. Verse 38, I'm sorry, there we go. Verse 38. So, Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying um, against it. And Jesus said, remove the stone. And Martha, again, reasonable Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So at this point, Mary's faith weakens because once again she's faced with the reality, this time it's the stink of death, she's faced with that reality, and the, the reality of death is stronger than her reality of faith. And that's normal, isn't it? When you go to your father's funeral or, heaven forbid, one of your children dies somehow and you're at the funeral and you're seeing their dead body, at that moment, boy, the, the reality of death, sometimes it overpowers the reality of your faith. So, you know, this, is, this is true of, of our everyday lives. All, death always seems stronger and more real than resurrection. So Jesus reaffirms her faith. He continues to encourage her to believe despite the doubt she experiences when facing the awful reality of death. Notice again, he doesn't say, oh, uh, 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 
You wavered in your faith, you're out, disqualified. He doesn't do that. He knows our weaknesses. He says, it's okay, just keep believing. I told you to trust me, keep, keep believing, keep trusting me. This is also true of our lives as well. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, through the Word, through the church, He's always encouraging us to believe in the resurrection despite the great argument for the finality of death that we see in our everyday lives. He's always encouraging us. And so verse 41 and two, so they removed the stone, then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. So he prays out loud to show the people around that the miracle he's about to perform is from God and that through it he will confirm that he is sent from God. One last powerful miracle to appeal to them. He also wants to show how God reacts to death, not with fear like the apostles, not with resignation like Martha, not with sorrow like Mary, but with power. That's how God reacts to death, with power. And so let's keep reading verse 43. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. So with a command, Jesus demonstrates his power over death by calling Lazarus back to life. Now, the people were no longer reacting to death. They were now reacting to Jesus Christ. The apostles now knew why they were on the right side and had no reason to fear. Imagine if you're doubting for a moment, am I on the right side here? Am I, am I on the right side? And then your leader resurrects somebody from the dead. You're going, yes, we're on the right side. <laughs> I'm feeling a little more confident. You know, it's like you're watching your favorite football game and your team is ahead 75 to nothing in the first quarter. You know, you're going, yeah, I think I'll take a pause and go to the fridge and get a Coke. You know what I'm saying? I think I can let the game go for a minute. We're ahead. And so the apostles you know, are reaffirmed in their original faith that they're on a winning team, so to speak. Martha now saw how valid her faith was. Jesus was not just a promise or a doctrine, He was the power that guaranteed the promise and He demonstrated that power before her very eyes. Didn't He not say to her, have faith, stay with me, watch me, be patient, I'll show you. And then of course, Mary could now go beyond sorrow to hope. She was stuck at sorrow. She could now go to hope. She saw that death, although sad, was not final. And this is what Jesus meant when He says, He who believes in Me shall live even if he dies, shall live now and forevermore. So let's go to verse 45 and 6. Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what He had done believed in Him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. So note once again, the result of this miracle follows the pattern of, the, of those that preceded it. A much bigger miracle, but what, what's the result? Some believed, some disbelieved. Same, same cycle, same cycle. And even with the powerful proof before them, some still chose to reject the evidence and remain unbelieving. I, I have no idea for the life of me how somebody could see a thing like that and continue in disbelief. But anyways, that's, you know. So John does add some further commentary here on the final impact that this miracle had on the unbelievers, especially those in leadership roles. So let's read that. Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council. Imagine, let's have a meeting. <laughs> Somebody just got raised from the dead, so what do they do? Well, let's have a meeting, let's have a committee, let's form a committee. <laughs> So they acknowledge the sign and they acknowledge the miracle privately made, but they completely miss its significance. To them, it doesn't point to God being among them, but rather somebody who brings a threat to their position of leadership. That's what they're afraid of. 
So in this dialogue, John confirms about these men what Jesus had previously said about them in his you know, accusatory, you know, we talked about the good shepherd and the bad shepherds, you know, this just confirms it. These guys are the bad shepherds. Verse 49, but one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. So despite their evil intent, God still uses them for the purpose of Christ's work. Caiaphas argues that it's better that one man die than the entire nation be disrupted or even worse, destroyed. His point is, if we let this Jesus guy keep going and doing these things, the Romans are going to come in and they're going to wipe us out, they're going to take our position. So it's better than we get rid of this guy so that we can maintain the status quo. A purely political, it was just politics. Purely cynical and political, okay? Uh, in other words, better, that, better this guy die than the nation die. So the argument he makes to win over the council to plot with him a way of destroying Jesus. Now John adds a kind of an editorial comment here that even though the whole high priest was saying this from an evil motive, God was actually making a profit out of him despite himself. That's one of my prayers. I think it's a good prayer I share with you. In, in one of my prayers I say to God, please God, do not allow the evil one to use me unknowingly. In other words, he's using me like Caiaphas here. You know, he's using me and I don't even know he's using me. Please don't let that happen. Better you're using me and I'm not sure how or I don't know why than he's using me against my will or because I'm just ignorant. You know, I'm doing something and it's bad and I don't know it and Satan is using me somehow to destroy someone with it. Please help me against that. So according to God's purpose, Jesus was sent to die in order to save not only the nation of Israel, but all the others scattered abroad, including Jews living outside of Israel and um, Gentiles. So John shows that even with all his power and cunning, the high priest was not able to outmaneuver God in his final plan. All right, let's just read the last verses and we'll be done for this lesson. It says, therefore Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. So they were seeking for Jesus and were saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think, that he will come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he was to report it so that they might seize him. So because the Lord knew of their plans and because he wanted to go to his death on his terms, not their terms, he leaves the city for a safer region, probably in the northern part. So Jesus was usually found at the temple teaching during important feast days. So they're, they're plotting, they're saying, you know what, he'll be, what they're saying is he'll be back. He always comes during the feast days. So let's just wait him out, he'll be back, let's give orders. When he comes back, anybody sees him, all points bulletin, right? All points bulletin. If you, if you see this guy, arrest him and bring him in. The plan is made, everything is locked in for now. And so with the last few verses, the stage is set for the final meeting between Jesus and His apostles and His subsequent arrest by the Jewish leaders and His passion. We started with the passion, we finished with the passion. All right, chapter 11, we'll be moving on next time we, next time we get together. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>